Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about designing and teaching an online art history class. Um, I've been here at Mount St. Mary for the past five years teaching the art history survey class and I'm going to uh, show you kind of what went into my thought process and uh, what kind of materials I use as well as some tips and and little tricks uh, that I use when I'm teaching online and and if you teach online as well then hopefully that will help you and uh, give you a little bit of insight into what I've been doing so I've been teaching art history for the past seven almost 17 years which I can't believe now uh, I started out face to face in the classroom and then about 11 years ago I started teaching online and I've been teaching pretty much every brand of art history class that you can think of as well as developing those classes too. So here is kind of an overview, just a quick list of the online art history courses that I've designed and also taught. The survey, which is usually broken up into one and two, uh, here at Mount St. Mary it's actually one class and art appreciation and modern art contemporary art and at some schools they're actually taught in one class together and then history of architecture so I've covered the gamut pretty much okay so the way I've structured this presentation today uh, I'd like to kind of break down what I see as the key components of an online course generally and then specifically an art history online course. So and this comes from I've done many training classes, online training classes including Quality Matters training. So uh, a lot of my thinking comes from all different places, all different sources but hopefully you'll get an idea of overall uh, what I'm interested in in really t teaching to my students and what I really want them to get out of an online class. So the first key component that I see for an online class and I've broken these down basically into interactions and I see really three major interactions and the first one would be the student interacting with the course material then the second interaction would be the students interacting with the other students and then the third interaction would be the students interacting with the instructor so let's talk about the first one and I'm probably going to spend the most time talking about this one how the students interact with the course material so I consider this component to be very important to understanding how you develop an online course. So really the first thing, and I, I am kind of starting from the beginning, is when you're developing an online course is to think of the overall organization of the class. How do you want the material to be organized? And in my mind that depends on which learning management system that you're using. And in all my years of doing this, I've taught basically, I think, on every learning management system that there's out there, uh, some, of, uh, some of which no longer exist. Angel, I don't think that exists anymore. Um, anyway, so Blackboard and Canvas are two very popular learning management systems. And when I'm developing a class on either of those systems, I like to have larger units, usually two units. and keep in mind this works well for art history because generally these classes are organized chronologically so I have the first unit being the earlier years and then the second unit being the later years and then within those two units I have modules for the individual topics now for Moodle which Mount St. Mary uses and if you're all familiar with that I really feel like the modules really just the best way to do that. It's it's difficult to break it down to organize it into anything other than modules or topics. So let me show you 
here's a screenshot of my class here at Mount St. Mary. And you can see modules. I've broken it down into, and you can see over here on the left, under the index, getting started, you can see how we've got module one, two, three, four, all the way through eight. So this particular class has eight modules, and you can see how it's broken down chronologically. So it moves from the very earliest art all the way to really the present day here in module eight. So that is the organization that I use here at Mont St. Mary. So then I like to ask myself this question, how can students best learn the material in an online art history class? So once you've chosen the overall organization, now let's think about this question. And over all of my years of teaching, I really came up with my answer, kind of the core of all of my classes, are narrated slide lectures. And this format works really well for art history. And it's, it's been interesting over the years, I've had a lot of skeptics who say, how can you teach art history online? That's impossible. There's no way you could do that. But I actually feel like it's very well suited uh, to the online environment simply because of these lectures. And I've put together uh, many, many hours of narrated slide lectures that teach the students about the art. And my thinking was, since I started out in the classroom face to face, how can I best translate that experience to the online environment? And the answer, my answer, uh, was the, the lectures, the narrated slide lectures. And I'm going to be giving examples of these in just a minute, but I'll quickly go over the other, uh, the other ways that I feel students can best learn. Uh, virtual tours of museums, galleries, buildings, and historical sites. And this is what is wonderful about the internet. Since I've been teaching over the past 11 years online, it has just exploded so many wonderful resources for, specifically for art history students. These virtual tours are really fantastic. You feel like you're there. I have to say, it's just, it, they're just really great. And I'm going to show you an example of one of those as well here in a minute. And then finally, websites and videos. And not that that's, you know, the, the least of it, but because uh, there are some wonderful, wonderful websites out there too for art related and art history sources. And videos have actually come along as well. I feel like in the past decade, uh, the videos have gotten. There are just a wonderful number of uh, great videos for art history classes. OK, so now I want to switch gears here a little bit. And I'm going to share my computer screen with you to show you some of these examples. So hang on with me. OK, so now I'm going to show you one of my lectures. Now I'm going to skip around a little bit just to give you all a good idea of uh, what's going on here. So what I used, I used a software program called Articulate, uh, which is, it's a, if you've all heard of Camtasia, and if you're not familiar with Articulate, this is basically a more sophisticated version of Camtasia. So it, it, at, its, at its heart is PowerPoint. So you, have, you do have the PowerPoints that you put together with your images, with your slides. But then you also incorporate audio. So you record the audio separately, and then you have to mix it all together. And Articulate is just a really wonderful program that can really make a, a, a really great looking, smooth presentation. And I like it because it allows students to skip around. We can, we can skip down to slide nine. And you can see you can have animations, and it, and then I can talk, and I talk about the art, 
and it lends itself really well to comparisons. So you can see how this is really how I achieved my vision of wanting to translate the classroom experience for an art history student to the online environment. And each slide lecture is, is a different length. This one up here at the top you can see happens to be uh, 24 minutes long. And I go through and then at the end I always have my major ideas that students I would hope that they take notes and they write this down. I always encourage them to treat my lectures as if they are sitting in a class with their notebooks or their, their computers open and taking, taking notes. But the great thing about these lectures, and this is why I, I, some students prefer the online class environment, is because they can pause it, they can go back, they can rewind, which is really difficult to do, obviously, in a face-to-face -face environment. So they're really, it's just such a, for me, this was just such a wonderful way to communicate all of the material that students need. And like I said, they can pause, they can rewind, they can go back, they can rewatch something, and I just feel like it's just a really effective learning tool. Okay, then the next thing I wanted to show everybody was a virtual tour. Here we're going to look at a virtual tour of the Acropolis. And I just have to say, this is awesome. <laughs> I love this. Uh, this is just, this is fantastic. So let's take a look. And, and this is great because students can spend, you know, as little or as much time as they want to on these sites, poking around, looking at everything. And it, it really is like you're in Greece. <laughs> It's just, uh, I think it's just a really, really wonderful resource because then they can really get an idea of the surrounding space, of you know what the building here, we're looking at an example of architecture, but you can get an idea of, of the texture, of the stone, of the, of the marble, of all of the, the decorative programs um, here, the, the sculptures. And you also get a sense of the ruins. You get a sense of just how old it is. So this is a really great example of a virtual tour that, that I think is fantastic. Um, and then let me show you a video. And this was quite sophisticated too that I think is great. I'm going to skip around just a little bit. So here they're explaining the illusionism in Masaccio's painting, which, and this is like you're in the classroom. Anyway, uh, those are some of the examples of the material that I use in my classes. So now let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so we just looked at example of my slide lectures, of a virtual tour, and of a video. So the next thing to consider is what assignments and what assessments work best to reinforce the course material in an online art history class. And over the years, I've come up with many different types of assignments and assessments, quizzes, essays, exams, papers, projects. And then this is also an important element when you're designing the assignments and the assessments. And this, this comes from my Quality Matters training, and this is this is prevalent now in online in the online environment where you have to make sure that the assignments you're creating are in line with the course objectives with the learning objectives so I want to spend just a few minutes and actually take a look at one of my uh, one of my big projects that I have in my class, most of my classes. And of course it depends on the requirements of the, the particular college, what they, what they require students to learn. 
whether they require essays, whether they require exams, or a certain number of written words. Uh, that, you know, like I said, depends on the college. But uh, in most of my classes, I require a museum paper. Uh, this can also be a project. So if if the students, if I don't have the students have write an actual paper, they can do a PowerPoint presentation. So this could, this is adaptable, and uh, it's it's a very it's a very nice assignment that that can be adapted to to the needs of that particular course as well as a particular college. So just to give you an idea, uh, this is an example of um, of a class where the students, and generally, if the students can go in person to a museum and to actually look at the works of art in person, I always highly, highly recommend that. But of course, being an online class, I'm always flexible, and I always understand if because of other commitments that the student has that they're not able to go in person. But if they are able to go in person, uh, that is always preferable. And it depends, of course, on what college we're talking about. Um, this is, I, I also teach at uh, a college in, uh, outside of Washington, D.C. So here, these students, our hope, can go to the National Gallery of Art, but not always. Uh, in any case, you can kind of read for yourself uh, that they should choose from the museum's collection. And like I said, I want them to look at it in, in person to really to apply the concepts from the class. So and in a lot of cases, I don't require them to do outside research. Uh, they can look to the course materials for any research that they need to do. It's more of a, an opportunity for them to, to learn the terms, because art history has its own vocabulary, and for them to be able to really use those terms to truly understand what they mean while they're describing a work of art. And then I also want them to compare and contrast that work of art to something that we looked at in class. So this is how I feel really gives the students the best opportunity to really apply the concepts that they're learning in the class. So that's the paper and or the project. And now I want to talk about uh, the the importance of aligning the assignments with the learning objectives. And I think this is very important in any online class. So I'm going to give you a, an example. And uh, beware, there's a lot of text coming up on this slide. But uh, I'll take it slowly so that we can really absorb the information here. OK, so here's a, here's a sample of a particular learning outcome for a history of architecture class. So the learning outcome is students will acquire the civic knowledge and understanding of cultural pluralism necessary for engaged citizenship in the 21st century. OK, so then how do you create an assignment that is in alignment with this particular learning outcome? So here's what I came up with. Here's all the text I was talking about. OK, so here's a specific example. So students will study the following buildings the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Museum of the American Indian, and the Holocaust Museum. These three buildings are some of the best examples of how architecture reflects not only cultural heritage, but also cultural pluralism in the United States today. Each of these buildings represents the culture, heritage, identity, values, and ideas of their respective group. Students will learn the significance of the following factors the placement and location of the buildings, the exterior materials, the interior materials and organization of the building, the function of the building, and how the greater community interacts with the building. Students will understand how the particular historical patterns and cultural heritage of a region, community, ethnic group, and specific location influence and determine the following factors. How a building looks, the function of a building, the site selected for a building, the materials chosen for a building, how a building space engages its surroundings, and how a building is seen and experienced by the greater community. OK, so I'll give you a second to kind of digest all that. I know that's a lot. Um, so the, the specific assignment is an essay assignment, then, that, that aligns with that learning objective. So after studying these buildings that best represent cultural pluralism in the United States today, 
the students have to pick one of them to write about. So they'll write about, they'll write an essay explaining how their selected building best represents the culture that the museum showcases. So students will be expected to explain how the building's appearance, both exterior and interior, and its materials reflect the function of the museum as well as the cultural heritage of the group that it represents. So here you can see I've got a, a picture of um, one of the buildings. It's the new National Museum of African American History and Culture. So this gives you a, a very detailed example of how it's, it's important to align your assignments with your learning objectives. OK, now let's move on to uh, key component number two, or the second interaction that, that I see in an online class, which is students interacting with the other students. So let's ask ourselves this question, how can students best interact with each other to facilitate learning in an online art history class? And this component, I feel, is very important to understand for the development aspect of an online course, just like interaction number one was. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing would be discussion boards. And you're going to see this in any online class. If you're familiar with online classes, you know that they all have discussion boards. But how do you use the discussion boards? And I use them in several different ways, one being academic essays and then responses. So I'll have the students write an academic essay. I'll give them a question. And then they'll have to write a formal, more or less a formal essay, and then read the other students' essays and make a response to at least one other student. Sometimes I'll have it be two other students. Just depends on the class. Um, then the other thing I like to, uh, I like to use the discussion boards for are questions of the week or opinion questions. So that, you know, there's really no right or wrong answer to these questions, but I feel like they really get the students interacting with each other, especially if you can ask something that is, uh, I don't want to say controversial, but somewhat heated, where students can form, can easily form an opinion. So, and I'm going to show you examples of both of these in just a minute. And then, like I mentioned, um, part of this interaction is also having them read each other's assignments and then respond. So in essence, they assess each other's assignments and then respond to, uh, to each other's assignments. OK, so now let's look at some examples of these. And again, bear with me. I'm going to switch to show you my screen. OK. So here we are in, in my class here at Mount St. Mary. And you can see how each module is designed pretty much the same way with similar assignments. So let's take a look at this one is a good one. This is an example of a more formal academic essay for the discussion board. So this particular essay is about changing images of Christ. So in this particular module, we look at many different works of Christian art, and particularly the image of Jesus Christ. And we look at how it changed, which was quite dramatically from when it first appeared in late antiquity to early medieval times. So basically, the question here is, from late antiquity to late Byzantium, how did the image of Christ change? So I show them these two images, one from a catacomb and then one from a Byzantine church. And they are supposed to compare and contrast. And I want them to talk about how the images are the same, how they are different, and how symbols are used, which story is presented, as well as the formal aspects. Is there a perspective? Is there not perspective? So that sort of thing. And then once they create their essay, and then here, you know, here's the discussion where they add their own essay there to the board. Then I want them to read another student's 
essay and then post a peer response. So this is an example and we are calling this Connections and Context Micro Essay Forum. So that's an example of one use of the discussion board that I feel is very useful. And then my question of the week, or my opinion question, I like this one. This one's fun. <laughs> they actually stopped doing this, but at some point, Costco was in the business of selling art. <laughs> um, so in this question, so this is, this is somewhat, you know, of a contemporary question. This is what's going on in, in the world right now. Like I said, they actually stopped doing it, but Costco was selling art. And I ask the students, what do you think? Do you think Costco should be selling fine art? Why or why not? And so like I said, this, there isn't a right or wrong answer to this. It's just really to get the students thinking about art in their own life right now, to get them to realize that art is around them all the time, and it is a part of our world right now. So um, this, is, uh, this is a fun one, and I get students on all sides of this question. Uh, no one ever really gets into a fight about it, but people are, you know, they have very, very strong opinions about this, and they, they're good at, at letting the rest of the class know, and it, it's really sparked a fun debate, I'd say. Okay, so those are examples of how I use the discussion board for the students to interact with each other. Now let's go back to presentation and let's move on to key component number three. So this is the third type of interaction that I see, which is the student interacting with the instructor. So when we ask this question, how can students best interact with the instructor to facilitate learning in an online art history class? I've got several answers and I feel that this component is really important to understand for the teaching aspect of an online course. So, you know, and it all kind of ties back, it all kind of, all, everything kind of goes together, but I, I feel like my narrated slide lectures are also important, not only for the development aspect of the course, not only for the students to learn the course material, but I feel like they can also get to know me through those slide lectures. You know, anytime I can, I always try to tell some sort of story about when I was in Rome and this happened, or you know, some some personal story that I that I think really helps the student to not only learn about the art but to remember it because of my maybe my it was a silly story you know it's something that happened to me um, like my husband tripping in Pompeii that you know I'll never forget that and those big those big stones on the on the on the ground um, in any case I feel like that's a really it's a really nice way for the students to interact and to kind of get to know me uh, and then I feel like email is so important. Email, email, email. Um, and it's funny, I, I think that there are some students now that feel like it's like texting. If they email you, you should instantly <laughs> respond back. Um, but really my policy, and you know, like I said, it depends on the, the colleges. Each college might have their own policy, but but for me personally, I feel like if I can get back to a student within 24 hours, you know, I've, I've really I've done a good job of of connecting with them and making sure that their question is answered. So I, I really cannot stress enough the importance of email and to respond in a timely manner. And for me, that's that's 24 hours. Um, on the weekends, it's not quite 24 hours, but I usually do end up checking my email on the weekends as well. So. And I just feel like that's just a part of teaching an online class. That's when the students are online. They're get, trying to get their work done over the weekend, you know, especially if they, if they work full time or part time and they have another job during the week. So, and then at night, usually I get students, a lot of students emailing me in the evening. So uh, that's one of my biggest pieces of advice, of advice for teaching online is to just be as responsive as you can over email. 
And then, of course, feedback. Um, feedback in several places in the class, but the first place I would say is on the discussion board where you have uh, such a high percentage of, of activity in the class. So I feel like it's really important for the instructor to make comments, uh, not only on, like, for instance, for my class, I've got the academic essays, but also the opinion essays, or, you know, opinion portions. So, I, you know, and I, I like, I really like to give positive feedback whenever possible. And if I have to give negative feedback on somebody's essay, on someone's academic essay, I usually try to couch it in positive terms. So usually I'll sandwich it. So I'll have, I'll try to start out with something positive, point out what's positive, then, then hit them with the negative, and then try to end with something that's positive too. It, even if you're just giving the student kind of a pat on the back and, and help, encouraging them to keep going, to, to try to do better next time, and always offering my help. I'm always offering my help to students to to do better next time. You know, show me a draft of your essay. Show me if you're not sure about this. Just email it to me. I'll take a look and I'll, I'll let you know before you end up posting it in the class. So the feedback I feel like is very important, but also to, to stay positive and to, to really encourage. That's so important in the online environment because I think it can feel impersonal. So if you're really engaged with your students and if you're really trying to be as positive as possible, I think that that comes through and I think that that helps them succeed in the online environment. And then of course feedback on other assignments, on papers, on essays, on projects. Uh, that's also very important and again I, I kind of follow the same format where I it, if there is a lot of criticism, I try to put it in between something positive so that the student isn't too discouraged, that I, you know, I want them to come away with the message, okay, I did this right, I did this right, I'm on the right track, and here's how I can continue to improve. Here, here's how I can continue to learn, maybe even in future classes. And if I, I feel like if I can help them, especially with writing, because that's such an integral component of art history, if I can help them to become better writers in the time that they're in my class, you know, I feel really good. I feel like that was a job well done if I can even help them improve just a little bit with even just a few takeaways on, on helping them to become better writers. Okay, so that pretty much does it for the presentation and, uh, and I'd love to open it up to questions. See, it looks like no questions. <laughs> well, uh, if there aren't any questions, I just want to thank everybody for coming. And oh, wait, we do maybe have a question. Yes, of course, definitely. Uh, I always post the syllabus and I always uh, post the rubric for each individual assignment. Um, and, and the syllabus at Mount St. Mary, there's two parts to it, actually. Uh, there's, there's the part that, that gives you all of the rubrics for each assignment, as well as the point values. And then there's also um, the course policies. So yes, definitely, the syllabus and the rubric always posted. Yeah, good question. Any other questions?
Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question too. Um, you know, it 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 depends. Um, it depends on the requirements of the particular college, but uh, you know, the attendance is more. I mean, I, I I that's a hard question because I know that that you know we're supposed to make sure the students are always there. They're always attending class, but really, in my mind. You can tell the attendance by how you know how timely they they are with their assignments. Do they post them on time? And also, you know, how well do they do on their assignments? You can tell how engaged they are and if they've been attending, if they've been actually looking at the course materials and absorbing the course materials by by what they post and by what their by what their assignments look like. So, you know, I I guess I'm kind of oh, it's hard for me because I, in an online class, I know it's it's easy for students to not attend, uh, but you know, it, I, I sometimes I feel like if I'm if I'm positive and I really encourage the students to participate and to attend, then I can get them excited about the class and and they want to attend instead of making it you know more like all right I got to check attendance I got to make sure you're there you're going to get points deducted so if I have to you know I'll do that but I really prefer students to want to be there. Uh, and to want to attend, but yeah, it's a it's a good question. Um, and is it self-paced? Can they move forward at their own speed? Uh, generally, yes. That's what I prefer to do. But like I said, if uh, if the requirements of the college say otherwise, if I need to have very specific deadlines, uh, then I do that. And usually, I like to have some something due once a week if it's a uh, even if it's a 15 week, 8 week, whatever length of the class that it is. But I also, I try to be as flexible as I can because it is an online class and I think that's why students take online classes a lot of times in the beginning is because they're looking for that flexibility. So uh, I do allow students to kind of go at their own pace um, with with certain deadlines spaced throughout the class. Another great question. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm so glad that you came today and and uh, listened to what I had to say. Thank you so much for coming. Hi everyone, this is William Beersack, Instructional Support Assistant for the Office of Online Learning. Uh, Rebecca, like, if there's no other questions to be had, I think we are good. I think we're good, yes, thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. Yes, thank you so much. We were happy to have you and on behalf of the Office of Online Learning, Rebecca, I would like to formally thank you for doing this webinar. It was excellent. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Of course.